My guest today is Teresa Greco. Like all of us, Teresa experienced the highs and lows of life. In today's episode, Teresa tells us her story of how she said enough is enough, said I'm going to choose happiness and continually chooses to find happiness in every moment of the day. Welcome to Lifeology. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. We have a mutual friend, Corey Poirier, a good friend of mine. He is, he sent me many people. He's been on my show. I've been in his show. If any of you listening or watching right now have wanted to be in TEDx, have a TEDx talk and aren't able to do it, Corey is a person that will help you with that. Go to bluetalks.com. That's B-L-U talks.com. And he will help you get on TEDx. So Corey, that's a free shout out to you as well. <laughs> anyway, but Teresa, for you, you, um, like I said, you have a, a, had and have a wonderful life, but you weren't being fulfilled. Help us walk us through the quote, normalcy of your life and the the joys and the highs and lows of that because as everyone can, is going to hear this right now they're like oh i can really relate with that tell us what happened with you thank you so basically for me it was the milestone of turning 40 that had me taking a step back and reevaluating my life mm -hmm. so at that time you could say that my life looked pretty perfect i had achieved all the things that family society culture religion told me that i needed to have a happy life so I had accomplished all of those things, fulfilling career, beautiful, healthy family, our own home, cars in the driveway, vacations a year, lots of beautiful material things. Mm -hmm. And so if my life, as I said, checked off all the boxes, how is it that I was left feeling unhappy and unfulfilled? And I now know I was on what is known as the satisfaction treadmill, where there was this feeling that something was missing, this void in mm -hmm. my life. And it didn't matter how much more I achieved, how much more I bought, how much more I earned, where I went or what I did, this void just didn't seem to be filled. And so basically I would set um, a goal or an aspiration for myself, work towards that, feel good for a little bit, and then return back to feeling like mm -hmm. unhappy. And now what? What do I need to buy now yeah. to feel good for a little bit? And right. then, so this is what that treadmill is like, is that we feel good for a little bit and then we're left feeling unhappy again. And we're looking now for that next best thing to, to fill us up. When you were 40, did you realize that you would have... I guess re retrospectively, when you look back, so you're 40 years old, and did you realize that the goals and dreams that you had, you, you had just accomplished them at 40? Because I'm sure that when you set out for that, sometimes we have this, at the end of life, I'll have achieved all my goals. And then we have 40, you're like, oh my gosh, I've, I've already achieved a lot of these things. Did you realize that you had come that far? And I'm sure there's like, now what? So at that, at, at that point, as I said, I had a fulfilling career. So mm -hmm. I'm an educator, but I do lots of different things now. But at that mm -hmm. time, I was an educator and educational technologies consultant, which I still am. But I had achieved that. So it's like, I, you know, I went yeah. to school, lots of degrees and, and mm -hmm. certificates and all this um, and feeling very good at work, loving what I'm doing. But then there it was this something missing, sure. which it didn't sure. make sense. How much more and everything that I've ever tried to do is how may I serve? How may I serve? Everything that I do, it's always how may I serve? How could I learn more and be more so that I could be more and uh, for others as well as serve people in, in with through my knowledge? But then I was, it was like it didn't matter sure. how much more I did, I just wasn't meeting that. Yeah, like a lot of people, in especially in my my profession, and sometimes even religious uh, sectors as well, we have this aspect of always giving and always serving. For you, is it more of a cultural thing, more of a family thing to, to, that trained you? It's not bad. It's just that trained you or influenced you to say that you should always serve before you serve yourself? I think that was probably most tied to religion, mm -hmm. the giving. Of, so I grew up Catholic, went to a mm -hmm. Catholic school, um, always very um, close to God and, and really mm -hmm. trying to understand more about the religion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which now I consider myself more spiritual yeah, than I do yeah, yeah. Uh, religious because it, yeah. through through uh, my journey, there's actually been a departure from that. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, I think it it came more so from from that. Sure, and in that, you know, that's it's there's blessings and a burden to many things, and so in that, there's nothing wrong with serving others as long as you're able to give out of your excess and not out of your mm -hmm. uh, give out of your abundance as opposed to give out of your core. When you had this epiphany at forty and you looked at everything. And you realized something was missing. What was the journey that you took to discover what that means? Mm, thank you. So um, through the different principles and practices that I now write, coach and speak about, I realized that that something missing, that void was really my true and authentic self, mm -hmm. that I had lost myself in the living of my life. So in, in the achievement of all of those things, 
At the same time, I didn't even know who I was because I was so busy living up to all the external expectations for who I needed to be that I didn't know who I was because through, through me growing up as a young girl and then teenager and young woman, there were different things that were said to me by well, often well-meaning people, sure. family, right. friends, coworkers, colleagues, people that say, oh, you're too much of this or you're not enough of that. So for me, it was, oh, you're not pretty enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not athletic enough. You're not smart enough. You're not enough of lots of different things. And so because of yeah. that, it was which you don't you don't realize that you're doing this is all un unconscious right where your behavior changes and in order for you to be liked and accepted that was all rolled into me trying to be the perfect mom perfect wife perfect daughter perfect employee perfect educator perf everything that i thought i needed to be for everybody else and that that was one of those moments was that how does somebody get to 40 and not know who she yeah. is? Because my identity was so caught up in all of these external expectations. So that's something missing at the end was my true and authentic self. Mm -hmm. And that I needed to reconnect with that. I needed to get back to, and I'm still in the process. Think over 10 years I've been working yeah. on myself <laughs> is getting yeah. back to all of us, right? That as children, we are that true and authentic self until the world gets its claws into us and then has us believing a whole host of other things about ourselves, who we could be and what we could achieve in this world. So it is really about getting back to that. When you're telling me about how to be the perfect this, perfect that, on this side of the screen, of course, because I've been in the same situation before and we don't realize it, but on this side of it, just hearing you say the perfect aspects of all those different roles you played, that sounded exhausting. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm exhausted for her and hearing that. And so once again, no judgment at all because I've done the same thing. But now I'm sure in looking at all that energy spent, and of course you have wonderful, um, it was spent well, and in that with your family, et cetera. And now to be able to explore that within yourself, there there is going to be that that overabundance moving forward of all those things you attained before are now going to be greater because you're going to find out who you are. A lot of times we hear about the authentic self and in pop culture, it says this and you, you you see some people talk about their authentic self and then two seconds later, they're cussing somebody out. And it's, there's this incongruency between being authentic in all aspects of one's life. And so to find that consistency, it can be a challenge because I mean, there are times when I am... <laughs> I'll be very honest. There are times when I have a very strong faith in God. So here I'm talking to God and praying and all of a sudden somebody does something and my mind can immediately switch and I can have the most negative thought and then I'll just go back and take a praying. And I laugh because it's, it's, it's who we are. But it's the awareness of that because if people don't have the awareness as they make that transition, then that's the difficulty. So it's the awareness of this is the full spectrum of who I am. I'm working on myself as well. But when people don't have that awareness, then that's not necessarily, that's not an awakened person. It's just simply a reactive person. Yes, yes. And that for me, that true and authentic self is the love, peace and happiness that we are that as mm -hmm. children, when we are born into this world, we are love, peace and happiness. And, and happiness for me is not emotion. It's not a state of mind. It is a state of being right. that Eastern religions and, and Eastern philosophies and traditions have always known that happiness mm -hmm. is a state of being, which is we are that. So we are love, peace, and happiness. I also believe that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So mm -hmm. I am that first mm -hmm. in this human body. And so that is what the true and authentic self is, is coming back to the love that we are and, and returning and coming back to that when the world pulls us away. Because as you said, something happens and now you're like, and it's like, okay, how do I pull myself back sure. to the love that I am? And that is where our happiness resides. Happiness is a facet of love. Everything mm -hmm. stems from love. And so when we are connected to that love, we automatically feel happy. Oftentimes we, I agree with you. And oftentimes we have this concept of, or we don't realize that our five senses are there to protect us. And in that the world and society has created so much sensory overload.
You have all these different social media accounts, et cetera, platforms rather. And in that, we're constantly bombarded. We've all been, some of us have been to a casino before. And when you go to a casino, they make it as bright as possible, as loud as possible, as flashy as possible. They put oxygen into the, um, into the vents so you, you feel invigorated. So in that, there's so much sensory overload. And in that, you, are, you feel like you're living, you're existing. And then when you leave, you're like, oh my gosh, I spent all this money. What happened? And so often we don't realize that, I guess in juxtaposition, in other words, comparing to what you said, we don't realize that the aspect of with this, our senses are flooding how we perceive things. So that's when we become reactive. But what you're saying as well is removing the five senses, you can experience this regardless of what happens around us. So we're not, we're not going to be influenced necessarily by what happens because we choose happiness. We choose that love. We choose that authenticity. But when we allow the world to influence us, we forget that we don't, aren't able to go back to center. Mm -hmm. Happiness is coming home to ourselves. That's what happiness is. And that a huge weight can be removed from your shoulders when you know that you don't need to buy, earn, find, achieve, or pursue anything to be happy. It is inside of you flowing always in abundance. That is just, it's like the electricity that's flowing through all of like the walls in our home. It just mad. It's just a matter of us plugging into it in order for us to feel happy. However, when we're working 60 to 80 hours a week and we get to the end of the week and we say, oh, my life sucks. Yeah, it does. Because how much time did you spend connecting to the happiness that's yeah. flowing in abundance within you? And so I look at happiness as a two-sided coin. One side is how much time are you spending connecting to that place of happiness that is always there within you to feel and to feel in abundance. The second is there could be blocks that are preventing you from feeling that happiness. So happiness is like the sunshine that it is always there. Even when the clouds float in front, yeah. it's that we don't want to unpack our bags and stay there. Absolutely. We should feel into the emotions that, that maybe are part of those clouds, but then what, steps can we take to return ourselves um, to the happiness that we are? Yeah. In psychology, we have um, what comes to our thoughts. Our perspective about our perception about a situation determines how we feel. How we feel determines how we respond. And so in that, our perception about something is can be based off of the reactive aspect or the stimuli, or it can be based off of our more centered foundational piece. So I was explaining to people, we have a first response and our second response. The first response, when we experience something, it, it, it affects our amygdala. The amygdala is the lizard part of our brain, which is, it's, it's the most primitive aspect. Or, am I in danger? And so we always look for the negative, unfortunately, because that's how we perceive danger. There are tigers not eating us anymore. So the danger can be that person looked at me wrong, so therefore I'm angry. And so that's how we kind of understand life. But if our perspective about the situation is going to be to protect us all the time, that's going to affect my emotions. My emotional state will then be aroused and all of a sudden I'm going to be angry or I'm going to be, um, I'm going to have rage or whatever that might be. And then from there I respond either through words or through actions. And so when we can find that ability in our first response to be aware, this is how I feel. The second response is now, what do I do with that? I can respond this way, or I can change my perspective to say, how can I look at this differently? I can respond in the way the first response and there are going to be repercussions. I don't like to apologize to people. So I try not to do the first response. So that's why I come back to the second response and say, how can I perceive this differently? My, my spirituality, my meditation, all that is, is what gives me the fuel to be able to find that second response to then say, I'm going to let that go. Or I'm going to choose to ignore it. I'm going to do whatever I want, but I'm going to do it from a, a place of being intentional about it as opposed to being reactive like my first response. Yes, absolutely. And it is about having the tools to know how to handle that situation so that we're not reactionary. So I have two coaching programs and one deals with giving people the tools they need that in, in every week and six weeks, they learn a different tool that when a situation happens and they feel themselves being pulled away from the love, peace and happiness that they are, that they can immediately apply a tool that can return them to peace. So the program is called mental freedom. And to me, mental freedom is a return to peace, a return to ourselves that, as I said, we are love, peace and happiness. And therefore, our peace is always also within us. We just have to, again, come back to that and having the tools, as you said, mm -hmm. meditation or mindfulness mm -hmm. or breathing or any of the things that you know work for you in your toolkit of things to bring you back, to realign yourself with that peace. Yeah. yeah. Often we don't realize, like I was talking about the stimuli earlier, is when, I'm, when someone is feeling something, 
we may not realize the biochemical aspects of what's happening around us or within us rather. And so often if we don't want to feel something, for example, if we're feeling bored, we may not have a name for it, but if you're laying on the couch and you don't want to feel that way, what we often do is once again, allow our external self to watch something on TV. So we watch a reality show that has all this fighting. We get sucked into it. So if I'm feeling bored, the, my body's experiencing the very, the, how do I say this? The neurochemicals are, are pretty much flatlined for lack of better words. Watching something like that on TV creates adrenaline. Adrenaline is energy. So therefore I'm feeling adrenaline. I'm feeling by proxy through the TV, this adrenaline, I'm feeling all of this. And so we often use external situations or external things like food, sex, um, drugs, anything at all to have us feel a certain way. So we can find that happiness, find that euphoria. And so when you, when a person looks at how they interact with others, are they causing arguments? Are they causing drama? Are they causing something because they are looking for something? Because once again, what happens is the brain is activated. So it gets all these chemicals that feel different than the norm and the norm can be boring. As we know, the norm is mediocrity at times when we don't realize it. So coming, you know, talking about this thing that you teach as well, when it comes to learning how to reset yourself, not allowing that endless search for dopamine hits through TikTok or through other things, once again, nothing wrong with TikTok, time and place for everything. But in that, it's important to realize if you're continually searching for that, you're never going to find it. For example, when you were 40, you had this epiphany, had wonderful things around you, but constantly searching for something. I've done the same thing before. But when you're aware of the habits you create and don't realize how much it influences you, you'll see, wow, I'm really allowing my external self or the, the world to influence how I feel. I want to choose to feel differently. So in that, finding your meditation, whatever those practices may be, that's something to allow yourself to decouple your responses from the world to then say, I get, I have a wonderful joy today. I've decided how do I want to feel in every situation? And in that, that's our choice. That's our agency. That's our ability to really determine we have the choice to decide how we show up in the world. And that's not by situations. That could be when you're by yourself. And when you're by yourself, how do I want to feel? Do, do I want to be that authentic self where I'm laughing or I'm doing whatever it might be? But that's a choice we can make. And, you know, people like you as well, they, they teach you that every moment is your choice. And when we forget that, unfortunately, the world uh, determines who we are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When we're, we are conditioned to be so outward focused, right? That this is mm -hmm. why we believe that happiness is found in our possessions, positions, titles, degrees, relationships, experiences, and appearances, all tied to mm -hmm. everything outside of yeah. ourselves. But oftentimes, even what you're referring to, I refer to that more as pleasure that we're engaged in some, in something. And then that feeling good lasts for a certain amount of time and then goes away. So mm -hmm. happiness is not that it's not a fleeting emotion that yeah. we feel when things are going well in our life. Ha and I use happiness and joy synonymously for me, they're the, the same mm -hmm. word. Um, they're not pleasure. So that's different. Mm -hmm. Um, because as a, as, um, I said, it's always there within you to feel. And so that's the difference. And when even making a choice, so I, I often see that too, happiness is a choice. Happiness is a choice on a mental level is only our mental self making okay. that decision. And then same thing with our emotional self, happiness as an emotion is only that aspect of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So happiness, which is what my dissertation is on, um, so it is, it's all, my PhD is going to be on um, inner happiness and the steps that we can take to connect with that place is aligning all aspects of the physical, mental, emotional with the spiritual self that is always happy and happy in abundance. So how do we align the other aspects and what steps can we take mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah. And I should have qualified that earlier. I look at happiness as two different aspects. So happiness is a small H happiness is our emotions based off of a response. And then the capital H happiness is that intrinsic aspect of it. So that's how I look at it in different. So one's reactive, mm -hmm. one's responsive, and one is a state of being. Um, so in that, congratulations on your dissertation first off. I remember, and I don't know if the stats are now, like 10 years ago, if I remember correctly, that if a person makes over $70,000, anything above $70,000, their happiness level is the same. The research may have changed, but at that time, um, and $70,000 is a lot for many people. And in that, beyond that, people who make more than that, their happiness doesn't change because if they're able to afford a certain, a certain amount, they don't have to worry, necessarily worry about their bills, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, nothing changes. And so in that, people don't realize that doesn't matter how much money you make, you're going to continually search for something that you, you know, we're saying right now can have within yourself as well. And so, uh, yeah, so I was just thinking more, I guess, along the aspects of, they say money doesn't, doesn't, um, you can't buy happiness. And so we hear that all the time, but yet we still do it. <laughs> Try it. And it 
It's so funny that you're bringing up that study. And so actually next week I'm going to be doing a TEDx talk okay. and it's based it's based exactly on that research and the follow-up research to that. Okay. So that study was done in 2010 uh, and okay. um, the two researchers, Kahneman and Deaton, um, basically what came out from that studies, as you said, so it was actually 60 to 90,000, but oh, they just okay. gave the average of 75 okay. Okay. and said that anything beyond that people's happiness levels didn't increase. They, they had just basically plateaued that once your needs are met, it doesn't go up. However, a follow-up study that was released in 2023, okay. basically they reanalyzed the data from that study and another study done by, so this, this follow-up studies by Kahneman, Killingsworth and Mellers. And basically what they determined is that happiness for very happy people, which is about 30% okay. of the population that are at the high on the high end of happiness, their happiness continues to increase and at an accelerated rate after 100k. The plateau in yeah. happiness is only experienced by the least happy 20% of the population. Okay. Oh. So for those people, it doesn't matter how much more money they have, they're still unhappy. And so the talk is basically mm. how my story is very closely linked to this research oh, and really? that it wouldn't have mattered how much more money I yeah. had, I still would have felt unhappy. And the second part is what is it about the happiest 30% of the population whose happiness levels continue to increase? And the truth is for very happy people, your happiness does continue to increase and it's not dependent on money. Mm, happiness sense, yeah. increases with ha with more happiness so that more mm. the happier you become the happier it's it's, you, it's just yes. like this up cycle of just being yeah, exactly. happier, 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 happier and happier and whether you have for those people that have under 75 or over 75 they're yeah. equally happy so it has nothing again to do with the money it has gotcha. more to do with the happiness yeah. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the follow. I didn't realize that follow just happened. So yeah, I'm so I'm, I'm a fa as a researcher, I'm fascinated by that. I'm curious how they quantified, and this is where my scientific part comes in. I wonder how they quantified or how they measured the people that are really happy. I'm wondering what the questionnaire was or what the study was to find that independent variable because you know everyone's gonna have a different perception of that. I mean, obviously you don't have to tell me that, but I'm just more curious about that because obviously they they found out how to measure that successfully and have mm. and concepts like happiness or constructs like happiness, it can be difficult to quantify that or measure it because you can't see it. So if you can't see it with your five senses, how do you measure it? So obviously they did a great job. And so mm -hmm. anyway, that's, that's fascinating. So thank you for sharing that. I can tell you that offline. I yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm curious, yeah. I, I, was curious. <laughs> I was curious about how they did that too. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Well, Teresa Gregor, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Our time is, we flew by. If my viewers and listeners want to find more information about you and to learn all about you, where will they find this information online? Thank you so much. So you can definitely check out my website at teresagreco.ca. You can also follow me on all my social media channels, which is at, so, at Teresa Greco underscore Steps to Happiness. On Facebook, I'm Teresa Greco or Steps to Happiness with Teresa Greco. Awesome. Well, my viewers and listeners also know that if you can't find this information any other place, simply go to the show notes at jamesmillerlifeology.com and I'll link you with Teresa Greco. Thank you once again. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>